Hey you guys, it's Peter and welcome to my channel Peterisms where I tell stories of my life and just little things that I've learned as I've grown into the person that I am today. And it is a beautiful early fall evening outside and I'm getting ready to go on a little double date with my husband and our friends. So I thought I would sit down for my last video of the day and read some meditations from books that I haven't read already today. Um, I have The Language of Letting Go by Melody Beatty, um, The Daily Book of Positive Quotations by Linda Pacone, uh, Healing After Loss, Daily Meditations for Working Through Grief, and Meditations for Living in Balance by Anne wilson Chef. So I'm just going to randomly uh, go through these meditations and just talk and we'll see how long this takes us. I, I probably won't read all four meditations. So today is September 4th. Um, do I have one of these dog-eared? Which ones do I have dog-eared? This will be good. Changing perspective. That's interesting. Okay. Um, that one is later in the month, so we'll be coming up on that. Let's go to the book of daily, uh, the, the daily book of positive quotations. Continuity. September 4th. Even if I knew that tomorrow the world would, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. Martin Luther. To quietly and peacefully go about our business sometimes requires great courage. Events in the world or in our own lives may make us want to scream and wail, tear our heart out, or beat our heads against a wall. But we don't do any of those things. We square our shoulders, look straight ahead, and carry out our daily routines. We try to restore normality or normality to what feels like we try to restore normality to what feels like chaos. I admire people who just keep going without bragging or feeling the need to tell everyone about it. I can be one of those people. Um, interesting that that last little part about bragging, that wasn't really what I got from the meditation. What I was thinking about in the meditation was, you know, when you like have your daily life, but like all this other stuff is going on in the world or on the news or in social media or with your friends or whatever, right? And it's a distraction to what's going on in your life. And it's really hard to stay focused sometimes. So I have this little trick that I do, right? It's going to sound crazy. Uh, but one of my favorite movies ever is Trip to Bountiful with Geraldine Page. And if you've never seen the movie, uh, it's about, it takes place in the 40s, I think. And Geraldine Page lives in um, somewhere in Texas with her son and her daughter-in-law. And all she wants, Geraldine Page is this fantastic stage actress. And she actually won an Academy Award for this movie. And all she wants to do is get back to her hometown of Bountiful, Texas one time before she passes away. And um, she's older. She's like in her 70s. And so the whole movie is about like her, you know, taking like getting to the bus and taking a bus to this town. And then there's really no, there's, there's no town left there anymore. It's gone, you know? And her one friend, this Callie, I think her name's Callie Davis. I don't know how I remember that. My mom and I used to watch this movie all the time. But it's one friend of hers, Callie Davis, is like just passed away like the week before. And she says things in there like, oh, my, my girlhood friend, Callie Davis. Anyway, and she sleeps on this bench in the bus station. And it's, it's a very calming movie when you watch it. And uh, Rebecca De Mornay, who was in, uh, what was the movie, Risky Business, that played the prostitute in Risky Business, is in it. And you want to talk about some great character acting. Um, she plays a newlywed to somebody that is in the military. And Geraldine Page sits next to her on the bus. And it's like this fantastic, it's this one of the most fantastic scenes of any movie I've ever ever seen but at the end of the movie she gets to go out and see the home the home that she grew up in and um it's this house it's like out in the middle of nowhere right and she's like walking through it and her intention is really to stay there and and they're saying to her there's like no electricity there's nothing out there and she's like that's okay like i've done this before i can do this on my own i can you know and she's you know she's really believes that she can at her age stay in this house in the middle of nowhere and she's looking at these birds and She's like, I don't need all that. I don't need electricity. I don't need any of that kind of stuff. I can do this on my own, right? And I often think about that, you know, that people that kind of like live off the grid or people that live out in the middle of nowhere or people that have never, you know, like heard of the United States. You know, I think we sometimes don't really believe that there are people in the world, in the world that exist, you know, that have never heard of world religions, that have never heard of politics, that have never heard of the United States or Europe, that they just, you know, like they live this absolute existence that we, ab we can't relate to, you know? And I think about that sometimes when I'm really distracted by other things. Um, and I think to myself, what it might be like for them because they're not getting those outside distractions. I also think about the day that my mom passed away, you know, and what that whole day was like for me and the night afterwards. And really anything that happened that day just was not anything in comparison to what I was going through of just, um, 
I, I was very connected to the moment, if that makes sense. Like of what I was going through, I was living each minute, each moment, you know? And I was very connected to the moment. And it really wouldn't have mattered, I don't think. I mean, in all honesty, it really wouldn't have mattered if, you know, World War III started or, you know, like some, it, it just, nothing that would have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered, you know what I mean? Like, I just, that's where I was in my head at that moment. So I do have the ability to, and I have to go back to those kinds of thoughts. I do have the ability, you know, to think about what really matters today and not allow myself to get distracted by other things. Another lesson that I did, like I learned years and years ago was that when I'm going through something that to me in that moment feels like a real struggle, I ask myself, laying on my deathbed, looking back on my life, let's say if I make it to 80, hopefully, right? So if I'm laying on my deathbed and I'm looking back on my life, is this thing that I'm going through right now gonna be something that I'm really focused on? Will it be even on my radar? Will it even be one of the things I'm thinking about when I look back on my life? If not, why am I giving it so much power? Why am I giving it so much energy? A lot of days I'm not there. You know, a lot of days I'm consumed with just crap and all that. But, you know, sometimes I can do that. And it's it's not about going right to perfection every time and waking up and always being there. You know, it's like, today I woke up. <laughs> so yesterday, um, I was, I, I woke up yesterday and I was just kind of like, I was tired and I was emotional and whatever. And today I woke up and I could kind of feel like myself going there and I was walking out to go get my coffee. And I literally said it out loud. I said, not today. I go, not today, Peter. Like, no, we're going to listen to some happy music and we're going to cheer ourselves. But I did. And it literally took me like five minutes. I was just like, you know, like what, what's going on, you know? And it's like nothing. I don't really have anything in my life right now. I have a very blessed life, you know? So I have nothing to be down about. Out. And I think sometimes it's just using those tools to get us there. I don't, you know, like there is no such thing as perfection. So it's about using the tools that we have to get us where we need to be, you know? And I am blessed that over the years I have been given or I have cultivated a lot of tools in my life to get me to peace and serenity. So, you know, I think being distracted by things that don't matter, um, sometimes we want it too, you know? Sometimes when there's like too much life is too heavy it's like we want to kind of get distracted by stuff you know I mean I've been there as well and it's interesting because I'm really so I just finished Grace and Frankie on Netflix and you know TV shows for me I like have a hard time sitting down and watching a TV show all the way through but I'm trying to finish some of my favorite shows on Netflix and so I just finished Grace and Frankie and I was like okay I need kind of like I want like an escape from the real world right it was so sad at the end of it I was talking about this on my vlog last night and then I'm watching Orange is the New Black and it's like I understand they're trying to tie everything up because this is the last season but it is so sad like the whole season is so sad I was talking to my friend Tanya about it because we watch Went, uh, Wentworth too and I said and Wentworth is very sad and I said I feel like they're taking a page out of Wentworth like it's just I'm like watching this to escape and I'm just like sobbing watching it you know so anyway good meditation okay let's go on to uh let me see what the language of letting go is about today September 3rd I went right to October we're not there yet Oh my God, that was another one in perspective. That's interesting. Perspective keeps on coming up. Um, oh, this is a good one. Word of power, September 3rd. I actually don't remember reading this one. I know I am controlling, but so is my husband. This is a quote. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying it's a quote and not mine. I know I am controlling, but so is my husband. Possibly more controlling than I am. Each time I set out to leave him, each time I started to walk away, he knew exactly what to say to pull me back in. And he knew I'd respond. He knew how to say exactly what I needed to hear to keep me where he wanted me. He knew what he was doing and he knew what I would do. I know because after we began recovering, he told me so. Anonymous. Some, some of us are so vulnerable to words. A well-timed I love you, a chosen moment for I'm sorry, an excuse, an excuse delivered in the right tone of voice, a pat on the head, a dozen roses, a kiss, a greeting card. A few words that promise love that has yet to be delivered can spin us into denial. Sometimes it can keep us denying that we are being lied to, mistreated, or abused. There are those who deliberately set out to sway us, to control and manipulate us through cheap talk. They know they fully understand our vulnerability to a few well-timed words. Break through your naivete. They know what they're doing. They understand their impact on us. This is where my mom would talk about people of the lie. If you've ever read that book by Scott Peck, it is super powerful. We do not uh, have to give such power to words, even though the words may be just what we want and need to hear, even though they sound so good, even though the words seem to stop the pain. 
Sooner or later, we will come to realize that if behavior doesn't match a person's words, we are allowing ourselves to be controlled, manipulated, deceived. Sooner or later, we will come to realize that talk is cheap, unless the person's behavior matches it. Amen. We can come to demand congruency in the behavior and the words of those around us. We can learn to not be manipulated or swayed by cheap talk. We cannot control what others do, but we can choose our own behaviors and our own course of action. We do not have to let cheap, well-timed talk control us, even if the words we hear are exactly what we want to hear to stop our pain. Today, I will let go of my vulnerability to words. God, help me trust myself to know the truth, even when I am being deceived. Help me cherish those relationships where there is congruity. Help me believe I deserve congruity and truth in the behavior and the words of those I care about. That is such a great meditation. And um, I could talk about that in so many different uh, ways, but I was talking to a friend of mine in sobriety today and um, who's early in sobriety and we were talking about the word I'm sorry in regards to family, you know, and I, I've said this a lot in a lot of my videos and I know a lot of people misunderstand it, but I have to say that this has been actually one area. I haven't really talked about this in any of my videos, but this has been one area that I have really learned a lot about in the last year. So when I was early in sobriety, um, or before that, when I was using all the time, my go-to response to my dad for everything was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And my dad finally said to me one day, he said, I don't ever want to hear you say I'm sorry again. I'm sorry just means forget what I just did. And he goes, every time you say I'm sorry to me, it just means forget what I just did. He goes, you don't take any responsibility. You don't take any ownership. You're not looking at your behavior and you're not changing your behavior. He goes, you saying I'm sorry means nothing to me. So through the years, I have worked on taking ownership. So when I go to somebody and I say, hey, listen, this is my behavior. I need to take ownership over it. You know, I harmed you. I'm sorry. You know, in that situation, I, you know, would say it. Like, what do I need to do to make it right? But I take ownership. It isn't just saying I am sorry. Making amends to somebody, taking responsibility is, you can have an I'm sorry in there if it matches your actions of taking ownership, doing something about it, and whatever. So that's been kind of my life, you know, for the last 20, you know, four years and eight months that I've learned that I'm sorry doesn't mean anything. Well, in the last year, I have learned that there are a lot of people that just because to my dad, who had a history of me saying I'm sorry, I'm sorry didn't mean anything to him. I've learned that today, there are a lot of people in my life that really need to hear me say I'm sorry to them. And there are times that I need to hear somebody say I'm sorry. You know, that it isn't just about taking ownership over an action. Isn't They, they want to hear you say, I'm sorry. They want to hear you apologize because that word does mean something to them. Recently, my husband and I, when we were in Las Vegas for our anniversary, we did um, a Q&A and we talked in there about how one of the things that my husband taught me was that, you know, like words don't really mean a whole lot to him. Words only have the power that you give them. Well, the reality is that the words I'm sorry have some meaning to some people and not to others. Today, what I've learned is it is okay for me to say I'm sorry to somebody. It is okay for me to say I apologize to you. But I also have to have the actions to back that up. I also have to be willing to take responsibility for my actions. And I also have to be willing to show growth through that. You know, I can't, the, the thing in the past was I would just say sorry and then move on. There was no taking of responsibility. There was no let me show you through my actions that I'm a different person, you know. Today, I, I want my behaviors to be congruent, like they talked about in this message, you know, with the change that has occurred in me, for me, as well as for other people to witness. And I also want when people say to me, I'm sorry, for there to be, you know, a part of that, that I'm hearing what they're sorry for. Don't just tell me that you're sorry. What are you sorry for? What is it that you feel that you did that needs an apology, you know? And I think that's like, you know, a huge part of making amends. Whenever I make amends to somebody and I process it with my sponsor, one of the things that she says to me is, what are you making amends for? Like, I want to know specifically, because you're not going to just make amends to fix a situation. You're not going to just say, I'm sorry, and blanket this statement. You're going to specifically make amends for what you feel like you did and nothing else. Because then you can take ownership over those specific pieces. But you aren't, comp when a friendship or a relationship or a work situation goes awry, you aren't responsible, you out there, none of us, we aren't responsible for everything that went wrong. We're responsible for certain, certain specific pieces of that. 
And when we can look at those specific pieces of that, we can start working on that and taking responsibility for that, then those are the areas that we can work on, right? And um, that I think in the last year, what it's forced me to do is really take a look at specific behaviors that are a pattern that have come out that I need to take responsibility for. And when I see those patterns, and those give me the ability to have an opportunity for growth, to work on those specific areas. And I have today, you know, like I have in the last year or two, and um, it's been amazing. And you know, and I'm not the person that I was yesterday or a year ago. Um, I'm also not the person that I'm gonna be six months from now, you know? We're gonna continue to change and we're gonna continue to grow. And I think that it's about our behaviors onward and upward moving on with that, you know? And I think it's fair for us to expect congruent behavior to match the apology or to match the words that go along with that. So I like that meditation. It's a good reminder for me, you know? Um, I think the thing that's changed too is that I don't have a lot of um, situations today where I need to apologize to my dad. That's that's one of the miracles of recovery too, is you're not you know continuing to you know put that out there. But I don't have a lot of situations where I need to apologize to my dad today, or you know. But like if I'm running late for a lunch or whatever, and I'm like, hey, I'm really sorry, I'm running five minutes late. Like that does mean something to him today. You know what I mean? Because he knows the next time I'll work on being there a little bit earlier. So anyway, let me know what you guys think about those meditations. I love you, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.